period piece with, you know, some kind of white male protagonist overcoming a sort of disability to prove that he's worthy of someone's love. And it tugs at the heartstrings and there's emotional music, right? That's usually the Oscar bait category. And this film is about as far removed from that as you can get in terms of a mainstream Hollywood movie, which is why it is significant that it did win all these awards. Um, and genre films, you know, like action, sci-fi, thrillers, horrors, those don't get recognized as much. You know, it's still viewed as a bit of a lesser genre, which is unfortunate because horror is such a, a great, interesting genre, you know, this idea of that we're watching these horrific things that no one is supposed to want to see, but we're somehow fascinated by it. And yeah, it's just real it's just real interesting, you know. So it's pretty important that this film was recognized for its achievements. A lot of genre films that should have been, you know, more recent one I think is like Tony Collette in Hereditary and Florence Pugh, that's her name, Florence Pugh, in Midsummer. I mean, she was nominated that year, but not for the movie that she should have been nominated, you know. So a lot of great stuff there. Um, so why is Science of the Lambs, why was it such a big hit at the time, and why is it, you know, still talked about today? Well, let's, uh, I guess, get into the heart of that, shall we? The fact that I'm drinking a dark and stormy has nothing whatsoever to do with this movie. I just thought of the pun, dark and stormy night, and wanted to do that. So I did, because it's my channel, and I can do that, you know. As we say, the continuing adventures in Tars' descent into alcoholism, right? At least it's socially acceptable, I think. Um, so, Silence of the Lambs. It's a murder mystery, crime thriller. We follow young Agent Starling, played by Jodie Foster. Uh, she's a new recruit to the FBI, trying to rise up in the ranks. And she gets assigned to a case to find this killer, a Buffalo Bill. And to do this, they're enlisting the help of a psychiatric prisoner, um, a former doctor, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, played by Anthony Hopkins. And the idea is that they believe that he can help provide evidence that might lead them to finding out who Buffalo Bill is, and where he is, and why he's doing what he's doing. Um, but of course he's not just gonna, you know, help them out and stuff like that. I mean, you know, he's a notorious, notorious criminal, murdered many people, and they're holding him up in a cell. So, not about to just simply spoil all the fun. Why would he? So there's a lot of back and forth scenes between Agent Starling and Dr. Lecter. And very intense moments, very well written. Um, a lot of close ups in the film. And it's interesting because I remember I watched most of this film. I don't know if I watched all of it once, but like a good chunk of it a long time ago. Maybe when I was a little too young for this, of course, as always. And I gotta admit, I wasn't the biggest fan of the film originally, and I didn't really like the way it was shot. I was like, something about all the close-ups, it kind of felt like forced and awkward and like, discount Stanley Kubrick, you know, like it was just, I don't know, trying to look artsy, but not actually being artsy. And I kind of felt it was a little overrated. Um, but I've I've rightfully changed my opinion on that, don't worry, I got better. Um, I like the POV shots because, like, so many of them is it's like, you know, a character's face, and they're in 
this sort of centeredness and they're talking directly to the camera like you know we uh, found Lecter around in this area here and we still need to find some things about him or something uh, but I'd like you here to go over these case files on your way out thank you very much whereas the POV shots where we see the agent starling they're a little more off center you know something akin to something like all right well it's very good to be working with you here today so thank you very much i guess though if it was clarice she'd be a little more like oh well thank you very much dr lecter um but if you ever tried pointing that high power perception that you have at yourself did you ever think about that the reasons why you did the things that you did i mean you didn't scan your victims no now you ate yours so they're slightly off-centered so that she's not talking directly to the camera, right? This reinforces the idea that all the other POV shots we are Clarice and that the other ones, she's not talking to us, the audience, she's still talking to the characters because she's looking slightly off-center so she's not actually talking to us, the audience. So, that's actually a nice touch when I sort of noticed that. It's uh, very nice. It helps put you in the shoes of the protagonist. And then, Dr. Hannibal Lecter. What an iconic villain. He's not in the film very much. He kind of disappears from the last third of the movie or so. Um, yet, he still got a Best Actor award for it. Even though he's definitely not a lead actor or a lead character in this movie, he's just so iconic and steals every moment he has that essentially he feels like he's in the film a lot more than what he should be. It's kind of like Darth Vader or the Xenomorph and Alien. Such iconic, terrifying characters that even though they're barely in it, you feel like they were it a lot more. Like, Darth Vader only has about 34 minutes of screen time across the entire original trilogy. Alright, so that's like six and a bit hours. He's only in it for half an hour of that. And then the Xenomorph in Alien, it's not even on screen for two whole minutes. Most of that, which is at the end of the film, when Ripley's trying to blow it out the airlock, Javik style. So, a similar thing with Hannibal Lecter. He shows up quite early in the movie. Uh, we got a very intense scene near the start where she goes to interview him, and he's just in the middle of his cell, standing there, menacingly. Lots of back and forth between these characters, very well-written dialogue, great lines, very creepy and off-putting. That's the great thing about this movie is that it doesn't need to show you so much um, physical violence and on-screen gore and blood to creep you out. All it needs is a good soundtrack and good acting and very spooky lines and a good delivery. That's all it takes, right? Like, there's a bit where just before Starling goes in to Hannibal's cell area, cell block. Um, there's an orderly there, or an, um, uh, what is it, Jack Crawford's head of the FBI, um, mind blanking now on his, uh, his doctor, the, the old friend he's having for dinner, right? Uh, but they're all telling, you know, Agent Starling, you got okay, we, we, they walk through all this security, right? And a pretty lengthy moment that I think a lot of films these days wouldn't include down all these stairs, through these security checkpoints, past all these bars and these guards and these procedures and protocols, and the whole time they're telling her, okay, you can't go near the glass, you can't give him anything like that, don't accept anything he gives from you, watch out for all these things, don't say these things, don't tell him too many things. And then they also show her this photograph, which we never see, about how, oh, we, we brought him for this appointment or something. And there was this nurse here, and he was, like, for a few seconds and somehow he managed to like disfigure her face so badly that like 
they say like, oh, the surgeons managed to like partially reconstruct her face or like reattach her jaw or her nose or something like that. And then later on, all we hear is that somehow he managed to like talk to a guy in his cell next door because he didn't like that guy. And he made him like bite off and swallow his own tongue so that he choked to death on it. And you don't even need to see anything to be creeped out by stuff like that when it's just so well presented in the way that it is in this film, right? Like, it's such good build-up and atmosphere, and that's just, that's what's great about it, right? They don't have to have a jump scare every five seconds. They don't have to be like, oh, there's a spooky ghost, oh, oh, oh. It's just simply, hey, he's a man, a person like any other one of us, but he's just gone so far beyond reality that he'll just, like, eat people if he gets a chance and bite their faces off, if that's what need be done. That's brilliant. I love it. So, throughout the film, um, intercut with Starling's journey to find Buffalo Bill, we see he's kidnapped this girl uh, in a method that apparently it was Ted Bundy, actual serial killer, he used a similar method where he pretended to be crippled and, you know, people would be like, oh, you poor thing, and they'd help him lift this sofa into a car and he'd use that as a chance to knock him out and get him inside his vehicle. Um, and so then he's, like, collecting women because he wants to, like, make this suit of flesh, female flesh, out of all these different victims. Pretty grotesque stuff. I will say one element of this film that is perhaps a bit dated is the movie. The movie is not implying that people who are transgendered, transsexual, anything like that, that they are violent in nature. You know, um, Clary Starling specifically has a line saying, well, Dr. Richter, many individuals like this do not show signs of violence. So it's not trying to reinforce that stigma. However, though, it is a little bit telling that, you know, our main villain is a straight white male and his whole thing is he's killing women because he wants to dress up in their flesh and become a woman himself. So, I don't think it's intentionally trying to demonize transgender people or anything like that. But it is unfortunately got a bit of that association with it. It's like a lot of films that deal with like men mental institutions or, you know, uh, schizophrenic people. Like, majority of those people are not violent in nature or anything like that. But it is a common trope that, oh, if you've got a mental illness in film, that means you could at any second turn into a psycho murder killer and go on a killing spree. So, um, it is a thing in horror movies, unfortunately, when it was quite stigmatized in the early days of slasher films. And it's still a bit present to today, though I think that we as an audience are a little more aware of this trope, and we understand that it is heavily fictionalized, that, you know, we know it's beyond reality, right? It's not necessarily what represents our world. So, it is a thing to keep in mind. I mean, you know, there's the, the scene, the big scene. Right, uh, the goodbye horses scene, where he's like, you know, dressing up in an outfit, and he's wearing a wig that has like somebody's skull cap head attached to it still, and you know, he's all like, y you know, the lines. I'm not gonna say them here. I don't want that on on video. <laughs> um, but you know, Jay did a good parody of it in um, Clerks too. You, you know that. Um, and, you know, he stands back from the camera and does a little, you know. So, it's kind of a thing where it's like, yeah, I really enjoy the movie, but I do recognize that you have to watch out for the uh, implication of 
such things. That's um, you know, something that was not widely talked about then. Perhaps would be a little more in the limelight these days. Um, you know, because isn't it that isn't it that J.K. Rowling wants to write a book where like the main character, or the whole thing is it's like a a straight male character who's killing women because he wants to like be transgender or something. I don't know. This is all outside territory for me. I'm not going to claim to know anything more than what I actually know. <laughs> you know point is, it's you know, something you got to recognize, and that's the way it is with a lot of older media. It is dated because it does not, it, it was not created now, it was created then, so obviously it's dated. You just have to recognize what elements are dated and what we need to adjust in our mindset for these days and watching it through the lens of someone in those days. If that makes sense. This movie's still great, of course. It's fantastic. Um, and then eventually what happens is uh, Lecter gets himself transferred to a new institution where he's going to be stored there, but he managed to take this bit of a pen uh, off of one of the doctors, and he uses that to escape in a horrifyingly creepy scene, where he manages to overpower the two guards, because he catches them by surprise, and it's not that violent of a scene, you know, like it was this movie, like 90, 91, right? It's not that violent of a scene, and compared to stuff that came out around similar times, it's not that violent. But it really feels very effective because there hasn't been much throughout the film. And you've heard tales of how messed up Hannibal Lecter is and the stuff he can do. You know, that they've got to transport him in this, like, straight jacket with this face mask so he can barely talk. And you finally get to see what he's capable of doing if he is literally let off the leash. And it's horrifying. He, like, ends up tying up this guy like a moth butterfly and stripping his guts out. And he carves off a guy's face and puts it on his own face so that he can hide as a dead body and get transferred on this ambulance. And the whole time his heart rate never got above 85. Really messed up stuff, you know. Um, of course, eventually, Agent Starling manages to find out where Buffalo Bill is, though not intentionally. Um, she thinks that she's just going to a friend of one of the victims, and uh, that's where we realize Buffalo Bill has been staying. Great moment where she's told in uh, earlier, during a training scene, to remember to check her corners. And she doesn't check her corners when she goes into Buffalo Bill's house and misses the fact that there's a framed butterfly in the background that would have tipped her off about that. Uh, but she later sees a bunch of butterflies and moths flying around. So that, that does tip her off. Um, and then, oh man, the one thing though that um, I told you when I watched the film the first time that I wasn't really impressed by it. Um, but the one thing I do remember loving the first time and well, every time really um, is the night vision scene uh, where you know Buffalo Billy kills all the power and they're in the basement and all the lights are sealed and he's got night vision goggles on and everything's just seen from his perspective in the goggles and he's like literally he's got his hand like right in front of her face but she can't see anything and yeah great scene but she manages to hear the sound of the gun clicking he turn around and shoots him shoots up at one of the boards at the same time oh such a great moment. Very intense, very intense. It's just so simple but effective. And that's what this movie is. It's very like simple and not too much happens in it. A lot of it's just going around from different FBI buildings and crime scenes and the likes of that. Um, but what it manages to achieve with it is something quite special indeed. So, yeah. It's still a great film still holds up very well, minus the obviously one dated element of which, again, if that stuff is not something that concerns you, then, you know, you don't even really need to worry about that, 
guess, you know, I'm a little more of a person inclined to notice tropes that could potentially be harmful, so that's why something like that does stick out to me. But yeah, it's a real great film, spooky, intense, well acted, well directed, and I'm glad it got the recognition it deserves, because as we know, there are so many great films that unfortunately don't get recognized for their greatness. We had a lot of great horror movies from recent years, and sadly I think they get collectively lumped in with your generic haunting spooky ghost movies with loud jump scares and boring characters and the likes of whatnot, so oh well, at least this one got recognized, you know. One little victory. Anyway, I think that's about all I have to say. As usual, my final checkup mental tally of things I wanted to say versus things I said. No, that's about it.